Hey, what is up, guys? It's Thunderstruck115, and today I'm gonna be doing another response video, because I guess I'm a response channel now. Now, initially, I wasn't planning on doing another response video until after I finished up the Black Ops 1 Zombies map analysis series, but this is a special one, because we are going to be looking at another video by Tim Hansen. Now, a couple months ago, I responded to a video of his dogging on Black Ops 4 Zombies and that video got a lot more popular than most other videos on my channel. Of course, at the same time, I got ratioed into oblivion. So, when Tim Hansen releases another video that basically just doubles down on his opinions that he'd made in the last video, what would any reasonable content creator do? Maybe leave it alone because I got ratioed last time? Nah, I'm in second to make another one. Honestly though, I've been kinda waiting for this video. Ever since he announced that he was gonna do a retrospective for each game in the series, I knew eventually we'd get to Black Ops 4, and I was pretty interested seeing as how his last video went. And honestly, I was not disappointed. I certainly found this video very, uh, interesting. You can basically consider this video a sequel to the last one I made on Tim Hansen, in effect. Now, I will say this video definitely isn't anywhere near as bad as the Griffin Gaming stream. There, he pretty much just made my job real easy. This time, though, on the surface, it doesn't quite seem like a bad video. But just beneath the surface, you'll start to notice some issues with it, and luckily, I brought a shovel. We are going to be unearthing contradictions to statements he's made in previous videos, contradictions to statements he's made in the same damn video, and taking one side of a particular issue, but then arguing for the other and just not realizing it. Anyways, let's go ahead and look at this, because this video is going to be a long one. Well, here we are. We've analyzed nearly every Treyarch Zombies game. It started off with Bare Bones World at War, then evolved into the significantly better Black Ops, then slipped into a quick identity crisis with the equally spectacular and depressing Black Ops 2 until the mode's peak was reached with a nearly flawless, highly expansive Black Ops 3. This of course brings us to Black Ops 4, which is set to release on October 12th, 2018 over a year since the debut of Zombies Chronicles. Now, the fact that I've already labeled BO3 as the absolute peak is really a tell that things only go downhill from here, which they unfortunately very much do. This game has some good, don't get me wrong, and we're actually gonna touch upon those things instead of just outright shitting on the game like I did in that unhinged rant I uploaded years ago. Well, I'm glad that Tim finally admits that his whole Black Ops 4 Zombies fail video was just a mindless rant and didn't have any actual critical thought into it. Glad we could clear that up. But I'll warn you in advance, there's going to be a lot of negativity, because this game exudes negativity far greater than any of its peers. I'll also preface this total dismantling with the fact that in a vacuum, devoid of any context, this is a quality game. And I mean it. There's plenty of fun and good times to be had. It's when context is injected, and when compared to its peers, most notably its direct predecessor, BO3, that you start to piece together how truly disappointing this game was relative to its high expectations, and how much of a mess Black Ops 4 Zombies is. That's kind of subjective. Personally, I prefer Black Ops 4 over World at War and Black Ops 1 because those are just a bit too simplistic for me nowadays. I mean, they were definitely fine for the time, but I think Zombies has just outgrown that, but Black Ops 4 holds up much better in my opinion, but again, I guess that is subjective. I actually want to start off with this clip of Lex reacting to my previous analysis on BO3 of all things. I thought he made an interesting point that I thought would be a perfect way to open up this video. I don't think Revelations was supposed to exist, and here's why. Black Ops 4 was exist was a game to exist to literally release the Great War map, and it never happened. Which means Black Ops 4 is a filler game. It is a filler game. If the whole purpose was for the Great War map to come out and it didn't come out, it's filler. It serves no purpose, which is why, chat, in some other different timeline that we live in, DLC 4 for Black Ops 3 was the Great War map, and it probably could have been one of the greatest zombies maps of all time, and BO4 was only chaos. Okay, I guess this is more of a criticism of Lex than it is Tim Hansen, but at the same time, Tim thought it was a good idea to include it in this video, so I guess it's kind of a response to him as well. At no point did Treyarch advertise the fact that the Great War map would be in Black Ops 4. Or even Black Ops 3 for that matter. Now, there was a lot of speculation that that's what it was, but it's just that. 
speculation. That doesn't mean that's what the developers intended for Black Ops 4 to have. It basically amounts to some members of the community building up this grand vision of what they think the game was going to be in their head, and then being disappointed that their own fantasy of what they thought the game was going to be like wasn't met. Now, would a Great War map be fucking awesome? Yeah, I think it would be. Does that mean that's what Treyarch was planning to release, or that's what the whole intent of Black Ops 4 was? No, not really. Did Treyarch ever intend to release a Great War map for Black Ops 3 or Black Ops 4? Maybe, but if so, then I haven't found anything regarding that. I just did some research. I cannot find anything besides fan speculation that the Great War map was going to be in Black Ops 4. Besides, Zombies has always been a gameplay-driven experience. Story hasn't really been the main focus of it. So as long as Black Ops 4 delivers fun, unique, and interesting gameplay, then no, it's not a filler game. Especially when you consider that the Chaos maps are a thing, the Chaos story as a whole is a thing, and in my opinion, they're freaking awesome. And definitely they were ambitious. My theory is that the Aether maps in Black Ops 4 were meant to patch up some plot holes in Black Ops 3, but again, that's just my theory. In other words, the reason why BO4 ever existed in the first place was to extend the Black Ops series lifespan just a bit further with one more game. Because really, if they can, why wouldn't they? Another year of Call of Duty is another year of bank, baby. They can sell Black Ops with ease. It could be Black Ops 6, 7, 8, however fucking far into the future they're willing to go. You're likely still going to buy it and try it. It's a vicious cycle of misery I used to participate in on an annual basis until I finally drew the line in the sand with Vanguard, which turned out to be a great decision given it's legit the worst caught ever. So, with potentially billions of more dollars to gain, Activision, not so much Treyarch, important distinction there, set their sights on the production of BO4, which ended up shafting the production of Revelations, which as we know ended up being quite possibly the most underwhelming zombies map ever given the build up and expectations. What do you mean Black Ops 4 stunted the development of Revelations? The plan was always Treyarch releases COD game in 2015, Treyarch spends the next year developing post-launch content for game, Treyarch works on new game to be ready by 2018. So where exactly are you getting this idea that Black Ops 4 somehow shorted the development time for Revelations, when the whole scheduling model went according to plan? I tried looking into if Revelations did have a shortened development time, but I couldn't find anything regarding that. If you have a specific source in mind that explains this, then feel free to link it. But the thing is, I seriously doubt that Black Ops 4's development stilted the development for Black Ops 3's post-launch content, especially considering Treyarch had enough extra time to develop a fifth DLC where they recreated eight Zombies maps from the ground up as faithful remasters for Zombies Chronicles. Just saying. Given what should have been the Great Apothecan War. Instead, that epic conclusion gets carelessly tossed into DLC 3 with this slowly animated cutscene. And that's the other thing, all of their production went towards the future, yet they couldn't even match the high quality CGI cutscenes BO3 did? Wasn't the payoff of an anticlimactic revelation supposed to at least be elite cutscenes for the next game? I just don't get it. On one hand, there were whisperings of budget cuts and staff cuts during the production, but again, in theory, they should have been locked and loaded towards BO4 given they shortchanged BO3. They did not shortchange BO3. If anything, BO3 got long changed. Is long changed even a word? Up until that point, the standard for Call of Duty games is four map packs post launch, with each map pack having one zombies map. Black Ops 3, however, got a fifth map pack filled with eight zombies maps. The fuck you mean it was shortchanged? Cold War was shortchanged. Black Ops 4, supposedly, was shortchanged. Black Ops 3? Hell fucking no. It never quite added up. I think one potential explanation could be Blackout, the new Battle Royale mode that launched with this game. It certainly shifted a lot of the devs' attention away, so much so that the campaign never saw the light of day. So it's highly possible that Blackout's production negatively impacted Zombies 2. Whatever the case may be, Zombies production felt compromised, not only at the end of BO3, but with BO4 as a whole too, which gave this game a huge disadvantage from the beginning.
Usually I analyze each map one by one, but this video is gonna naturally deviate from that, given there were four maps at launch. Let me repeat, four maps! Usually we only get one or two, but this game more than doubled that. This was all very exciting at first, because on paper, four maps is greater than one. There's simply more content, which is true upon first glance, until you begin to see the lasting effects of it, starting with Community Division. The Zombies community, comprised of you, the very person watching this, playing the games, is usually joined at the hip with one, maybe two maps to start off with. Not only providing a bigger sense of unity, but clearly establishing exactly which experience to focus on and what direction the game is moving in. For example, with BO3's launch, we were all playing Shadows of Evil, trying to learn the ropes and complete the Easter egg, which tied the whole community together in a clear direction. And what about the many people in the community that didn't like that direction? Shadows of Evil was the only on-disc map for Black Ops 3, and it was a really complicated map. Now, personally, I love me some complicated maps, but a lot of people don't. Some people just want to get their guns, get their perks, pack a punch, and just see how long they can survive. And if that's what you want, Shadows of Evil is an awful map, considering that pack a punch is so complicated that you pretty much need a guy to figure it out. I sure as hell needed one, and I had five years of zombies experience under my belt by that point. Sure, people were also playing the giant, but that was a direct remaster, so it's something we'd already experienced, therefore not really taking away from Shadows. The duality of those two maps is healthy for the game, but the- You're leaving out one important detail though, if you wanted to play the giant at launch, you had to buy the season's pass, which is $50. Yes, I know later on they made it available for only 5 bucks, but that wasn't true until sometime after Derise and Drock released. By that point, most people had either decided to buy the season's pass, or had probably moved on to another game. Now, if both maps were on disc, then yeah, it would be healthy. But they weren't. Only the really complicated map was, which pushed away a lot of casuals. The way BO4 did it felt overwhelming and confusing. The four base maps of this game are Voyage of Despair, Nine, Blood of the Dead, and Classified as a bonus with the Black Ops Pass, which, mind you, cost $50 as a standalone, essentially forcing a smart person to buy the Deluxe Edition to save money. Like and Black Ops 3 pulled the exact same thing by locking the giant behind the Seasons Pass until sometime after the Rise and Drock released. I will say, the Black Ops Pass was certainly a poor way to handle the DLC maps, like, why can't I just buy them individually? But right now, we're talking about the launch of these games, and in that case, yeah, Black Ops 3 had the same issue at launch. Except there, there was only one on-disc map, not three. I get it, Activision, you're greedy whores, but this was a bit of an overkill, especially when combined with the scummy microtransactions. The new alternative to the perfectly functional gobblegum system. The new alternative to the perfectly functional gobblegum system. So wait, hang on a second, Tim. You're bitching about microtransactions in this game, yet you call the gobblegum system perfectly functional? Do you have any idea just how pay-to-win the Gobblegum systems were in Black Ops 3? And yet you want to call out Black Ops 4 for its microtransactions? I'm not trying to say that the Black Ops 4 microtransactions were good or that they weren't pay-to-win, but Tim is so vehemently against these microtransactions in Black Ops 4 while at the same time acting like this shit don't stink the same in Black Ops 3. Tim, you gotta keep that same energy. The new alternative to the perfectly functional gobblegum system are now elixirs, which can be converted from their new currency, Nebulium Plasma? It appears fine until you realize it's inflated to manipulate you into believing you're gaining more when you're really not. The elixirs are also just so fucking lame, not nearly as cool or as identifiable as the gum, which were instantly iconic when they debuted in BO3. It's a prime example of the recurring theme of this game. Pointless innovation. Change for the sake of change, and not genuine improvement. I'm really not lying or joking when I say that I've legit never used a single Mega Elixir the entire time I've owned this game. Not to mention whatever the fuck these talismans are. I legit never equip them. Just the somewhat helpful classics. It has a lot to do with me not playing the game so much in the first place, but I also just don't respect the change and feel zero urge to use them. Especially given the recharge takes an eternity. Hang on, you're complaining that these new elixirs are lame, yet you said you haven't even used them? At least not the Mega ones. Now, I will say you are right. The Mega Elixirs aren't as powerful as the Mega Gobblegums. I know this because I've actually used them. 
The reason they aren't as powerful, though, is that they're not so game-breaking like the Gobblegums were in Black Ops 3, and therefore it's not quite as pay-to-win as Black Ops 3 was. Though it still has that element, and I still think it's fair to criticize that. I just think the hypocrisy comes in when Tim criticizes this game for being paid to win, when not criticizing Black Ops 3 for doing the same thing. And then he comes in and says that the issue with the Black Ops 4's Mega Elixirs is that they aren't as powerful as the ones in Black Ops 3. Ergo, less pay to win. Now, like Tim, I myself usually just run with classic elixirs, but it's not really because I don't find the Mega Elixirs useful, it's just that because they run on limited supply and are monetized, I don't want to feel like I'm wasting them by using them every game. Same thing for the Gobblegums in Black Ops 3. I usually just run with classics. Also, the recharge only takes a long time for the classic elixirs. On the Mega Elixirs, it actually recharges very quickly. So before you even start the game up, you're already paying close to, if not $100, for a game with no campaign and a somehow even worse, even more manipulative microtransaction system. You tell me if this game has a sturdy foundation or not. The four maps we get at launch are divided into two different stories. The okay, at this point, Tim starts talking about the story, and he also just intersplices talking about the story along with talking about the gameplay as each map progresses. Like I said earlier, Zombies, at least for me, has never been about the story. It's always been sort of in the background. The main focus has always been on gameplay. That's mainly what I'm going to be focusing on. I'll just quickly sum up my thoughts on the Black Ops 4 story here. I kind of enjoyed Chaos. I liked the characters, and the plot was interesting, though being told out of order was kind of annoying. Aether's story, I didn't enjoy quite as much, because it's basically the exact same fucking convoluted mess that it's been since the end of Black Ops 2 and all of Black Ops 3. I could debate Tim on some of the points that he makes about the story, but quite frankly, I just don't care enough, so I'm just going to be speeding past all of the points where he talks about the story. Although, one more thing I should note, I will agree with Tim that they probably should have either focused on wrapping up Aether first before starting Chaos, or just focused on Chaos entirely. As far as the maps themselves go, they really couldn't be more different from each other. On one hand, you have Voyage regarded as one of the worst maps ever, and Nine, regarded as one of the best. Voyage is of course based on a real ship, and so you're more or less recreating it rather than creating your own design with creative flexibility, therefore restricting how well it can flow for a zombies map. The ship is enormous, way bigger than you'd initially suspect, yet the entire inside of the ship feels extremely condensed, and we're talking Verruckt one zombie wide hallway condensed. There are also multiple decks stacked on top of each other that ultimately all look the same, making distinguishing different parts of the map much harder. Powering up these chaos maps means making your way to the Sentinel Artifact, and Pack-a-Punch on this map in particular is relatively easy, as you simply activate all four locations and move it to whichever final destination you prefer. Then it moves around every few rounds going forward. Nine had a far more unique approach to Pack-a-Punch, as you go to each respective temple, each themed after a god, mind you, Danu, Ra, Odin, and Zeus, respectively, and battle the current champion of said temple, claiming their head and some points after each execution. You then take the four heads and impale them in the central underground temple, thus, Pack-a-Punch. Along with the various badass themes comes a straightforward design with ample space. The map is essentially just the central arena with the temple below that branches off into four unique temples, making it very easy to navigate. There's also a major difference in atmosphere here. Nine has multiple, wrapped together with a beautiful color scheme and lighting, whereas Voyage is sort of just... gray? Look, I get it, we're in the middle of the Atlantic Ocean on a particularly frigid night. It's supposed to look a lot like this. But depressing is depressing. Which is exactly what Treyarch is going for. It really does capture that existential dread for me. Everyone is dead and the ship is slowly sinking and there's not really much you can do about that. Personally, I find that to be a very powerful atmosphere, but hey, I guess different strokes for different folks. And Nine isn't even close to that. You feel the grandeur of this map wash over you just as you walk out of the cage. The arena full of chants and beating drums has a way of amping you up. Whereas Voyage is sort of just like, well, great. We're on the Titanic. There's the iceberg. 
Here's to sinking into a deep depression. Both maps share insufferable boss zombies, starting with this monstrosity, the Blight Father. It's that creature from the opening cutscene that cocoons itself in one's stomach, then bursts out and vomits everywhere. Among other forms of assault, like grabbing you with its tongue and jabbing you in half with its praying mantis-like forearms, you put this thing down by shooting the spores on its back, and isn't necessarily easy to do so. But they don't appear frequently enough for me to mind them so much. It's the catalyst zombies that make me want to punch a fucking hole in my wall. They're everywhere, all the time, both on Voyage and Nine. And there are four different variants of them. Lightning, fire, water, and poison. They're individually weak, but collectively insufferable, as the lightning one blinds you, the poison one comes acid in your face, the fire one explodes and burns you, and the water ones don't do shit, other than make every surrounding zombie much beefier than usual. They're one of the worst ideas anybody at Treyarch ever had, and I genuinely hope whoever thought of them is somewhere equally frustrated as I am typing this out right now. The boss oh boy, here we go again. The catalysts are there to force you to think about which targets to prioritize and how you move. It's supposed to make the maps more challenging, and it does. You say they're frustrating, but that sounds to me like you don't understand how to fight these guys. The main thing is to just pay attention. The lightning catalyst can blind you if you let it, but his attack animation has a very obvious windup that lasts several seconds before he blasts out his lightning, which has a limited range. Additionally, he does not change the direction he's facing during this animation, which means when you see him do it, get the heck out of the way. The poison and fire catalysts are kind of redundant since the way you fight them is basically the same, just keep your distance. This usually means keep moving and stay away from them. Just treat the fire catalyst kind of like you would the napalm zombies on Shangri-La. As for the water catalysts, they're not much trouble as long as you take them out quickly, so whenever you see one, focus fire on it. Once you learn how to fight them, they actually provide a really nice challenge. Of course, I understand not everybody likes challenging maps, like I know back a few years ago I fucking hated Shangri-La in 5, but... Once I got better at zombies, I found out how fun they actually could be. As for them being overwhelming, yeah, on Voyage of Despair, I'd agree, I think they do spawn just a bit too much. However, the spawns for the Catalysts on 9, Death of the Night, and Ancient Evil have been heavily toned down. And they're far more manageable. That's unique to Voyage would be the Stoker, a giant fire demon who finds its way into the map in both a quietest yet deadliest fashion imaginable. It's there to serve its stereotypical tank boss zombie role, as are the Destroyers and Marauders from 9, the Destroyers being thick, heavily armored axe throwers with a meticulous pace, and the Marauders being a slider build, but are much quicker and much more aggressive as they leap around and slice. Nine also has Zombie Tigers, the equivalent of your classic Hellhounds, just newer and slightly beefier. While 9 has more boss zombies, I'd say they're higher quality and match the theme better than Voyages, so there's a bit of a trade-off there. The Wonder Weapons are also really similar. They can both be obtained via Quest or through the box if you're not interested in looking up the Waffles tutorial. Voyage has the Kraken. It's essentially a revolving cannon with four elemental upgrades. 9 has the Death of Orion, a scorpion blaster that chains zombies together like that of the Wonderwaff and can be upgraded as well. So while the two maps do share some core elements, they end up being two totally different experiences, Nine being universally recognized as the superior one. Like I said, that mainly has to do with the atmosphere and spacing, which Voyage unfortunately boxed itself into due to the faithful design required of it, whereas Nine gets total creative freedom, thus has an advantage. Nine is generally more player friendly as well, which in other words just means it doesn't suffocate the player as much as a condensed linear map like Voyage does. Minor things like challenges, traps, and extra easter eggs also add up and make 9 more dynamic. What's really interesting though is that when the game's trailer initially came out, it was the Titanic. It was Voyage that was far more popular and anticipated. 9 was ironically the afterthought map, since we all knew so little about it. And I'm not just saying this to jerk myself off here, but I was a part of the small group on launch playing 9 above everything else. I was genuinely excited for this map going in, and its success didn't surprise me, but it seemed to surprise everyone else. It ended up quickly becoming the hidden gem of the bunch. Before we go any further, we've got to talk about this brand new perk system Treyarch decided to try with this game. It's pretty simple how perk colas in the past operated. You'd simply walk up to one of the machines, drink, and from there on out you were biologically enhanced, making the monotony of endlessly murdering zombies more invigorating. 
I think what we all appreciate so much about the perks beyond just their helpfulness, though, is the vibrance they inject into an otherwise visually dull and depressing mode. Each perk has its own jingle, its own color scheme, and its own personality that makes attachment so much easier for the players. I mean, there's a reason why the original four are so recognizable and beloved. They add color in a gray world on top of being so damn good. Eventually though, Treyarch realized that perks like Quick Revive, Jug, Double Tap, and Speed, aka the first four fucking perks they invented, were being selected each and every time and were being heavily prioritized by the players, especially since lots of maps have a four perk limit. In other words, they're crutch perks, selected not necessarily out of want, but need, and so Treyarch aimed to fix this. I'll let Blundell explain it himself too. The problem is, is that everyone gets the same things. Mm -hmm. And so when we switched it on, we switched it on with all the normal perks, first time. And uh, we just took a surfing. We had like a little surfing monkey, right? We look at it. Yeah. And uh, everyone had the same perks. And we kept on adding more and more perks in the early days. Well, that's how every, pretty much the only time I ever diverged from the, the core four is mm -hmm. when I maybe got like an on the house or a, right. uh, or like perk And as soon as we took out certain perks, suddenly when I looked at the survey, mm -hmm. everything started changing. And I was like, this is what we want. And then people then started to have their own strategies. And then to, they had different strategies on their own than when they were with friends and with mm -hmm. certain friends based on how they play. And we're like, that's what we're after. I would ask the question of the, of the person say, why do you want joke? And they say, well, because I like to get to high rounds. And I go, okay, well, there's multiple ways you could change the game mm -hmm. to allow you to get high rounds. You can, if you change nothing and said, I want to do normal difficulty, I just want to, I don't want to do custom mutations, I just want to play the normal game. I'd say, okay, well, how do you play? I usually sit at the top of the catwalk and kill things. Right, okay, well then let's talk about uh, this perk. Let's put this perk in your slot, let's put mm -hmm. that perk in, and that's gonna be good for you, and that's gonna generate the same kind of effect. And they could tailor their loadouts to yeah. what? So essentially by removing Juggernaut and removing some of those beloved perks, you've given more freedom to the player. Yes. This new system came in the form of pre-selected perks, meaning you pick the four you want before the game even begins, and you're set with said perks for the entirety of the game. This instantly raises a problem, however, as it disables you from being able to down in-game and change your mind. You ever down with a full set of perks and decide, you know what, I kinda wanna switch things up. No! No! I'd like to try a different strategy that would prevent me from, you know, dying again. Yeah, so is literally everyone with a brain that's ever played this mode. And literally everybody else, huh? Okay, Tim, show me the numbers. Where are you getting this number that everybody changes up their perks in the middle of their run all the time? Cause me and a lot of other people I know of only really did that shit whenever a game or a map first launched and we're trying to figure out what perk setup works for that specific map, but once we figure that out we don't really deviate from that. And this was true even before the Black Ops 4 perk system. Like, on any given map, I pretty much know exactly which 4 perks I'm gonna be getting before I even load into the map. But, say, you do like to constantly change your mind. Well, there's this wonderful thing called secret sauce. There you go. So this cookie cutter format is already a problem among a long list of more to come. It boxes you in. So we only get four and we can't ever change our mind when we start. Now let's take a glance at these perks. It looks like we've got some returning ones like Mule Kick, Stamina Up, and Quick Revive which actually loses its solo ability given the implementation of self revives by default. Hold on though, folks, that's not the only perk that carried half of its identity into this game. We also have Deadshot Dealer, Electric Burst, and PhD Slider, which are all renamed for God knows why. There's actually quite a lengthy list of entirely new perks though too, including Time Slip, which speeds up all recharges, Death Perception, allowing you to see zombies through walls, Dying Wish, essentially quick revive solo ability, Stone Cold Stronghold, a camper's delight, Bandolier Bandit, the ultimate ammo restock perk, Victorious Tortoise, enhancing your shield's power significantly, Winter's Whale, an inferior version of Widow's Wine, and lastly, Secret Sauce. A randomly generated perk like that of the Wonderfizz machine, adding a fun, unpredictable dynamic to the game. Four other perks were also added with each DLC, including Ethereal Razor, the ultimate melee perk, Zombshell, an electric orb that slows zombies down, Blood Wolf Bite, which spawns in pooches for assistance, and Blaze Phase. Let's not talk about that one. You see all these new perks and you think to yourself, holy shit, BO3 only added one new perk. This game went above and beyond. Until you quickly realize that every single one of those perks float around the line of mediocrity together, not being outstanding in a negative or positive way. Just keep this clip in mind, folks. According to Tim, all the perks float around the same level of effectiveness. Because this is going to be very important in about a minute. What do I mean? 
Well, in previous games, we got a healthy assortment of both really good and really bad perks. A stark contrast between must-haves like Jug and must-never-touches like Who's Who and Tombstone, with some middle-of-the-road perks like Electric Cherry, for example, in the Fold as well. In BO4, however, all of the perks are middle-of-the-road, none being in one extremity or the other, which generally dilutes things and makes it unclear as to what's necessary or not. Of course, this was Treyarch's goal, as they wanted to eliminate that clear hierarchy for the sake of parity, but they unfortunately didn't even end up solving the crutch perk issue. Treyarch had this feeble hope of players picking a new set of perks every single time they played. No, that wasn't Treyarch's intention. Treyarch's intention is that everybody's specific set of favorite perks would be different from one another. Once I figured out what perk setup works for me for each specific map, I pretty much just stick to those. But what I consider to be the best perk setup on each map is different from what everyone else thinks is the best perk setup on each map. Lots of people like to run Winter's Whale. Personally, I don't really do that though. On the contrary, Victorious Tortoise, I actually labeled that as a crutch perk in my last response video to you, but looking back on it, it really isn't. While personally, I think it's the best perk in the game, surprisingly, not that many people seem to run it, which actually came as a surprise to me. But that just goes to show you that this perk system was successful. Treyarch's intention of having everybody have their own specific set of perks that they consider the best was realized. When in all reality, it goes against our human nature of wanting to figure out which setup we like best and sticking to it. For example, I personally pick the same two perks nearly every time I play, Stamina Up and Dying Wish, with the other two slots being somewhat flexible. So in all reality, they didn't really eliminate the crutch perk problem, rather marginally reduced it at the cost of reducing the whole system to a communist-like state of mediocrity. Wait, how exactly did we go from talking about the Black Ops 4 perk system to talking about communism? But in all seriousness, what Tim is describing here as being a flaw of this new perk system is literally what Treyarch was aiming for. He claims this perk system fails because people like to attach themselves to a certain set of perks, but that was the intention all along, for players to figure out what perk setup works for them. Now, maybe he'd have a point if the optimal perk setup for everybody was the same, like if, say, in all the previous games, everybody decided to go with Jug, Speed Cola, Double Tap, and Quick Revive, but that's not the case in Black Ops 4. When people start talking about what their perk loadouts are in Black Ops 4 Zombies, and when I read about that on Reddit, when the subject does come up, I notice how different everybody's perk setup is to one another. It's different from mine, and... One person's comment is different from another person's comment. So yeah, thank you for listing reasons as to why this perk system is good as a reason why it failed. You're really not making my job hard. Where did the OG4 perks go? Quick Revive was replaced with Self Revives. Speed Cola is obtained by having all four of your perks. And that's a bad thing. It means the original effects of those perks are still in the game, but it doesn't take up your perk slot so you can run what you want rather than what you need. AKA Treyarch's intention this whole time. Double tap is obtained by upgrading your gun five, let me repeat, five fucking times, costing a total of 15,000 points and lots of my patience and- Well, it's nice to see that my suspicions about Tim being a massive hypocrite regarding Black Ops 4's Pack-A-Punch system are 100% confirmed now. I brought this up in my last response video to him where he says he hates the Black Ops 4 Pack-A-Punch system but likes the Cold War Pack-A-Punch system even though what he's complaining about the Black Ops 4 Pack-A-Punch system for doing is literally fucking worse in Cold War. But at least there, there was at least a small chance that Tim changed his mind between releasing that video and releasing his Cold War video. But now, he's saying the same thing that he said in his original Black Ops 4 rant video, so yeah, 100% he's a hypocrite. Why? Well, I'm just gonna play the clip from my original response, because it's just as applicable here. There are three levels to Pack-a-Punching. There's level 1, the base 5,000 Pack-a-Punch. There's then level 2, for 15,000. And then there's level 3, for 30,000. That totals 50,000 points to upgrade your weapon fully to level 3. This, I don't find a problem. This, I don't find a problem. And nobody, and I mean nobody, wants to pack a punch their weapon five times, costing a grand total of 15,000 points 
to get their weapon at its fullest potential in damage. Nobody wants to do that. See? Same shit, different day. Extra emphasis on the shit. I guess Tim can't keep that same energy. Jug is simply given to the player right off the bat with 200 default HP at spawn. The Jug replacement proves to be the most damning of them all as it kills natural game progression. You no longer spawn in with a two hit down, walking on eggshells until you grab the almighty jug. Now it's a birthright that removes any real fear or challenge you're supposed to face early in the game. You're essentially a god with all of that health and that OP specialist you also get, which is pretty much a wonder weapon. Yeah, that's fair. I wouldn't say it kills in-game progression, but it definitely reduces it in a way I don't like. So yeah, I'll definitely give that one to you, Tim. Spawning in with max HP was dumb. I think they should have just had it as an upgrade separate from the perk system, and spawning in with a specialist instead of having to unlock it is also dumb. So yeah, I will absolutely agree with Tim here. Real quick on those specialists. There are eight of them in total, four Chaos and four Aether. They each have their own unique abilities. Don't get me wrong, I, I think they're all awesome, but like I said, it works hand in hand with the health boost to kill natural game progression, as you no longer have to earn it via quest, it's handed to you when the game begins. Same thing goes for the equipment, which you also choose before the game even begins. I mean, once again, fair. Although, I wouldn't really say it's the equipment system as a whole that's the problem, as much as the fact that Wraith Fires are just inherently more powerful than anything else in the equipment system including things like monkey bombs and other shit that you get while in game. Personally, I don't really think that frags, claymores, or even the sentry turrets too overpowered to start with. But yeah, once again, Tim makes a really good point. OP armory and elixir systems double and triple down on this, beating this game down to a mindless pulp the second you enter the game. The new alternative to the perfectly functional gobblegum system. And you lost me. You were doing so well, Tim, but then you brought up the armory and the elixirs as being reasons why it's too easy. I seem to recall earlier in the same video that you didn't like the elixirs because they weren't nearly as effective as the gobblegums. And now you're saying they make the game too easy, but at the same time you said you didn't have a problem with the gobblegums making the game too easy in your Black Ops 3 review. And also, you're criticizing the armory system here, even though it's literally the exact fucking same as the weapon kits in Black Ops 3. Yeah, there's more attachments that you can equip overall, and then there is the operator mods. But like the weapon kits in Black Ops 3, it doesn't make the gun so much more powerful than it is without attachments. It definitely makes it a little bit better, enough for you to want to grind for them, but not so that it kills in-game progression. Not to mention, you still have to get the weapons in-game to use them. Meaning, it doesn't affect you at spawn, with the exception of whatever you put on your starter weapon. And even then, the only significant thing would be the stiletto knife on the Strife, because that can one-hit melee kill up through round four, but that's only four rounds. You can't rely on it for very long. Tim, I'm once again gonna have to ask you to keep that same energy. As you can legit start with an SMG or shotgun with a myriad of attachments. Back to the perk system, though. These pre-selected perks are placed in the same four lifeless machines, and although you have the advantage of being able to choose where your perks go, it removes the personality and life that the original machines provided, the sales pitch of a jingle, the unique design and vibrancy, all of it. I appreciate the new modifiers, which enhances your fourth perk slot, but it's not nearly enough to make up for the absolute catastrophe that is the BO4 perk system. It set out to eliminate what wasn't even really a huge problem, and in the process, it not only didn't fix it, but made everything else about it worse. It not only didn't fix it, but made everything else about it worse. Okay, so remember that clip I told you to remember? Well, here it is again. Until you quickly realize that every single one of those perks float around the line of mediocrity together, not being outstanding in a negative or positive way. It not only didn't fix it, but- So, which is it, Tim? Either none of the perks feel any more effective than any of the others, meaning they're all about as effective, which means there are no crutch perks, meaning it did fix the crutch perk issue, or it didn't fix the crutch perk issue, meaning there are crutch perks, meaning perks that are quite clearly better than all the other ones in the game, meaning that, no, the perks are not all the same as each other in effectiveness. I don't know what's worse, the fact that he managed to contradict himself so many times in this video, 
or the fact that apparently he scripted this video and didn't somehow catch these contradictions when looking over the script. I know, I feel like I'm overusing this crap gamer clip, but I think it's justified because Tim just can't keep that same energy. On top of all of that, take a look at this HUD. It's fucking abysmal. HUDs of the past were so clean and only displayed what was absolutely necessary. But in this game, you see too much. I could have removed half the shit on here and minimized the rest to make it look way slicker than it does now. It's a major eyesore in this game. I can't ignore it. Personally, I don't really have an issue with the HUD because they keep most of the shit on the bottom, which means it's only blocking the floor. But I mean, hey, I guess your mileage will vary. I could go on and on about other awful changes BO4 made, like the new damage-based perk system that turns all guns into pea shooters. Damage-based perk system? I think you mean damage-based point system, since you showed the points counter. And honestly, damage-based perk system just doesn't make any sense. But at the same time, neither does his claim that this somehow turns the weapons into pea shooters as if the damage of the weapons has anything at all to do with the game's point system, because newsflash, it fucking doesn't. But the damage-based point system itself, yeah, I don't like that either. Awful zombie spawns, increasingly expensive shield replenishment. Okay, fine, I'll stop there. Awful zombie spawns and increasing shield replenishment? Care to elaborate on that? No? Okay. Personally, I like the shield system in this game because it means you have to pay more attention to it and not just use it with reckless abandon. And I have absolutely no idea what he's getting at with the awful zombie spawns claim. I have played a lot of this game as evident by the fact that I am prestige master level 300 or so, and I haven't experienced anything close to bad spawns. See, this is why elaboration is important, so that people know exactly what the fuck you're talking about. Dead storytelling, though not the cleanest and most decisive, is not the problem with this map. It really all falls on the gameplay and how little it did to enhance what was already essentially a flawless mob of the dead. I will first clarify the fact that Blood of the Dead is not your stereotypical, fully faithful remaster like those of Zombies Chronicles, rather a reimagined edition of the map. A remaster is a reskin, but a reimagine, like in this case, is a revised edition. It's expanded upon with major design changes, including some newly accessible areas of the island, making it an entirely new experience. With that being said, let's take a glance at the key differences in design here. The best part of Mob of the Dead, the Golden Gate Bridge, is completely removed, thus inconveniently displacing Pack-a-Punch into three separate locations. An entirely new section of the island opens up, providing two distinct segments of the map. The newer part where you spawn, and the classic mob part of the island, with a deadly catwalk in between. While this provides you with more space, it's not all that useful of space, as you typically make your way to the main part of the island, and never turn back. Other than the first of now two power switches, thanks for that also by the way, there's no compelling reason to ever go back in that direction, which is the biggest issue with such a linear map. Except you're ignoring that A, the brew perk machine is there, B, the pack-a-punch can move there, C, the mystery box can move there, and D, there's actually a really good training spot there. Okay, pretty much everything else he says about Blood of the Dead's gameplay, I agree with more or less. I say more or less because it seems to bug him more than it bugs me, but it's not really enough for me to really say much about it, so I'm just going to speed past this. I also pretty much agree with everything he says about Classified's gameplay, so I'm going to speed past that too, so that way this video doesn't get way too long. So with Blood of the Dead and the Chaos maps, 
Classified is the first taste of Black Ops 4 zombies we got. Like I mentioned earlier though, the community was so used to identifying with one or two maps at launch. Four maps with four different easter eggs to solve and two sets of characters to attach ourselves to begins to look like less of a blessing and perhaps more of an overwhelming start to what it would eventually become the most disastrous zombies title ever. You seriously found the launch of Black Ops 4 overwhelming because it had a lot of content? Yeah, I'm pretty sure there's only one person on this entire fucking planet that thought the amount of content in this game at launch was overwhelming. And that's your ass. Well, let me tell you, Tim, it was not overwhelming for me. And I don't think anybody with the mental capacity above that of a toddler would have been overwhelmed by the amount of content in this game. Which maps do you follow or prioritize? Well, simple. Try all the maps, play the ones you like more. It's really not that fucking difficult. For example, I spent more time playing Nine and Classified than I spent playing Blood of the Dead and Voyage of Despair because I enjoy Nine and Classified a lot more. Now, I'd still play Voyage and Blood of the Dead, but I'd play the maps I liked more. Like, I really cannot see how anybody could try and spin more content in a game at launch as a bad thing. Also, this was not the start to the most disastrous zombies game ever. The start to the most disastrous zombies game ever would be Duran Fang in Call of Duty Vanguard. Hell, you even said earlier in this video that you thought Vanguard was so bad that you didn't buy the game and called it the worst COD ever. But you bought Black Ops 4 and all of its DLC, and yet this is somehow the most disastrous COD zombies title? Tim, please, for the love of God, Take your brain out of your ass and put it back into your head where it belongs. I mean, right off the bat, there's an identity crisis even worse than that of BO2. But at least BO2's was predicated on a transfer of power between devs. This game's doesn't seem to have any rhyme or reason. We just get two chaos maps along with two ether maps with no real idea of where the game is headed. If you couldn't tell from my 30 plus minute verbal blowjob of BO3, great zombies games tend to have a clear direction and not leave the players with so many questions, or at least the wrong kinds of questions. Like, gee, which set of characters am I supposed to invest myself in? And half the maps are remasters, so should we be expecting a game fluffed with remasters? Pretty ironic coming from the dude who made a self-proclaimed verbal blowjob of Black Ops 3 despite the fact that that game has more remasters than original maps. In fact, according to Tim, the amount of original maps in Black Ops 3 is the same as the ones in Black Ops 4. And I know you might be thinking, but Thundercuck isn't Revelations an original map, and yeah, I'd say it is, even though it uses areas from older maps, the overarching concept is original. But if you watched his Black Ops 3 review, you'll know that he doesn't consider Revelations original. So yeah, Black Ops 4 only has four original maps, as does Black Ops 3. And in Black Ops 4, the maps that were reused were changed, updated, and innovated so that they play completely differently from the source material, whereas Black Ops 3 just sort of ported them over and played them straight. That's not exactly what I'd call fluff. So yeah, Tim, where's that same energy for Black Ops 3? Keep that same energy. With such a perplexing group of maps at launch, we as a community were naturally very confused as to where this game was headed. Chaos? Ether? We couldn't wait to find out, and we didn't until December 11th, 2018, when Dead of the Night released. Mind you, we usually know which map we're getting far in advance of the map's release, but for whatever reason, Treyarch didn't even upload a trailer for the map, which is a much bigger deal than you'd think. I'll agree with Tim here, not marketing Dead of the Night at all was pretty fucking stupid. I mean, they did upload the intro cutscene like the day before it released, but yeah, Tim's point still stands. With previous titles, we'd get this amazing hype trailer a few weeks in advance to build up anticipation and excitement for what's to come. I found out Dead of the Night released the day of on Twitter. That's a major problem. No hype, no buildup, no awareness whatsoever. Just plop. 
Here's the new map, guys. It's especially damning given it's DLC 1, which is far and away the most important map, as it essentially makes or breaks the rest of the DLC season. If it's a home run like Darius and Drac, you've successfully bridged the launch maps with the DLCs while maintaining the player's interest. If it's a complete flop like Dead of the Night, however, the game flames out right then and there. That's a fucking lie and Tim knows it. If DLC 1 is what truly makes or breaks a game, then Black Ops 2 would have completely flopped. Yet many people regard it as one of the best Zombies games. Even though the DLC 1 map Die Rise was and still is considered one of, if not the worst map in all of Zombies. Let's take a look at the map itself now. As we know, it takes place in the profound, lavish Rhodes Manor. The place seems infinitely big with, of course, the main living space in the mansion, but also the ample outdoor space. I absolutely adore this map's atmosphere. It's one of the most unique out there, and I especially love the color scheme with the contrast between the indoor warmth and the grim, frightening outdoor bits. You truly feel like you're in a game of Clue. I dare say this atmosphere is one of the most immersive zombies has ever seen. But unfortunately, those are the only flowers I have for this map. The rest of it is downhill from here. Like all the other Chaos maps, you start by activating the Sentinel Artifact, which then propels you into the Pack-a-Punch quest as you follow the clues that lead you to where the three necessary tuning forks are to unlock it. The three main puzzles are putting this ghost bitch to rest, winding up this clock, and slaying the vampire hordes. We're gonna get to these fuckboys in a minute, don't you worry. These tasks aren't so difficult to achieve until you realize there are more parts to grab on this map than any other map that has ever existed. There's multiple parts in multiple locations for what seems like an endless list of things to be obtained, including the shield, silver bullets for the werewolf. Don't you worry, we're gonna get to those fuckboys soon too. The steak knife, the wonder weapon and its upgrade, the savage impaler, the trap cores, and any other miscellaneous shit I'm forgetting, which I quite possibly am. I'll agree with Tim that the Pack-a-Punch quest is needlessly obtuse. Like, I honestly do not know how any casual player is reasonably expected to figure this out without a guide. So, I can understand why casual players might be put off from this map. Thing is, Tim's not a casual player. He says he hates the amount of parts that's in this map for all the extra stuff. Now, criticizing the Pack-a-Punch quest for that, I think is fine. The rest, however, hell no. Because they're extra things. You don't have to get them. The essentials are guns, power, perks, pack-a-punch, and arguably the shield. Those should be simple to obtain. Everything else, though, can be complicated because the point is to give the player something extra to do on the map and rewarding them for going off the beaten path. So you don't have to get, say, the steak knife if you don't want to. But for those that like to go the extra mile, like me for instance, it's there to provide extra content. You can still kill the vampires just fine without them, but it definitely helps. Same thing with the silver bullets. You, do you have to get them? No. But they turn the werewolf from a pretty formidable boss into a complete pushover. And this wouldn't even be so outlandish if Tim was a casual player. But he also likes maps like Origins, Der Eisendrock, Mob of the Dead, Shadows of Evil, Gorod Krovi, which all have a bunch of obtuse shit to get. More so than even the most tedious maps of the past, Dead of the Night pretty much subjects you to just walking around the perimeter of the map holding the engage button, since there's such an overwhelming amount of stuff to be accounted for. And it's not like Origins that rewards you with some of the best wonder weapons ever. These rewards, relative to how difficult it is to earn them, is more like Zetsubo. And that's why it's fucking awesome! You're really gonna criticize things like the steak knife or the silver bullets for not being rewarding enough? Well, the steak knife is a one-hit kill melee against the vampires forever, and it one-hit kills the zombies up through round 30-ish, if I recall correctly. Oh, hey, that reminds me of the golden spork, which takes about as long to get and is about as powerful. So why is the steak knife suddenly such a worse quest? Silver bullets? Okay, I don't really think there's been an item quite like the silver bullets in the previous Zombies game, but they turn the werewolves into a complete pushover. 
and Alistair's Annihilator is literally the best wonder weapon in all of zombies. It does infinite damage, has a fuck ton of ammo, and is extremely satisfying to use. Like, would you just prefer that these quests didn't exist? But then the map would have far less to do. Here's a bright idea, Tim. If you think getting all this stuff is tedious, then don't do the side quests. They're optional for a reason. But somehow even worse. Hang on though, it gets significantly more challenging because you're also dealing with a myriad of boss zombies on top of that. And some of the most infuriating ever at that. First and foremost are the Nosferatus, aka the vampires, whatever you want to call them, who not only show up in a ridiculously large quantity, but speed around the map and lunge at you, disorienting and damaging you. It gets even worse though, they have an even less tolerable variant, which literally hop on top of you and take you completely out of the game momentarily, which leaves you completely vulnerable and allows everything else to pile on as well. No, because when the Crimson Nosferatu bites you, you gain a zombie blood-like effect for a couple of seconds where everything else ignores you. As for the regular vampires, were you playing the pre-patch version of the Death of the Night? Because I remember when the map first launched, yeah, these fuckers were aggravating. But then they patch them and they spawn far less frequently and are much easier to kill. I'm not gonna lie and say that they're the greatest special enemy we've ever gotten, but they're not this bad. What's everything else? Let's try these giant fucking werewolves, which are admittedly really cool, but are the biggest bullet sponges of any boss zombie I can remember. Hence why you need silver bullets to take them down reasonably. They're sort of the equivalent of the Blight Fathers, except these guys are much quicker and much more aggressive. As somebody who has played a lot of Black Ops 4 zombies, I can confirm that the werewolves do not take that much more firepower to bring down than the Blight Fathers, and this is without silver bullets. Of course, if you decide to go out of the way to get the silver bullets, then these guys become an absolute pushover. So, if you want to make them easier, there's the silver bullets where you can do that. But you can still survive just fine without them. And yeah, it makes sense that the werewolf is more aggressive than the Blight Fathers, because unlike the Blight Fathers, it does not have a tongue grapple attack, it does not have a ranged projectile attack, and it can't lock down objects around the map like Brutus can. Just keep your distance and shoot the weak spot. And that's of course without mentioning the regular zombies and the fiercely toxic catalyst zombies that already make me want to not play the map. You heard it here first folks, regular zombies are too hard for Tim Hansen. It's not like the entire purpose of zombies is to, you know, fight zombies. As for the catalysts, I've already said my piece on them, moving on. You're beginning to see why this map is completely and utterly overwhelming. Even for the hardest of hardcore players, let alone the casual community. I I'm just gonna say, I am nowhere near the hardest of hardcore players. I don't really go for high rounds, but this map is nowhere near overwhelming for me. Then again, Tim Hansen's the same person who thinks that having four maps at launch is overwhelming, so why am I surprised? I mean, if you're new to zombies and this map is your first choice, do yourself a favor, quit and go play something else. You'll never want to play zombies again with this as your first impression. Hi Considering that Death of the Night is a paid DLC map, I highly doubt that this is going to be somebody's first introduction to zombies. It's far more likely to be a map included on the disc. Even if they did buy the Deluxe Edition, there's still seven more maps to try, and I highly doubt somebody is just going to toss the whole game in the trash without giving at least a couple of those a try. And if they do, well, they're probably not good with money anyway. The rounds on this map are more chaotic than any other map I can remember. There's so much going on that it legitimately feels impossible at times. The Alistair's Foley Wonder Weapon is aight, but you've got to go through this confusing scavenger hunt to unlock it if you're not lucky enough to get it from the box. When upgraded to the Annihilator, it's obviously much better and has some really cool elemental abilities, but like I said, that's an entirely separate process with multiple quests sandwiched together to even get to that point. And both of those quests are extremely short. The first one is so short that you can literally do this when you unlock Pack-a-Punch on round 6. Kill the werewolf that spawns with the silver bullets, bash the bookcase with the shield, bam, you got the Chaos Theory. Second quest is not hard either. The only possibly annoying step is if you're trying to get the zombies with the poison shot to uncover the part in the forest for you, and it just doesn't give you the correct shot. But that's one step, and both of these quests are really short. 
like the effort it takes to do both of them is about as much effort it takes to upgrade one staff on Origins. And when you consider that Alistair's Annihilator is literally the best wonder weapon in all of Zombies, I mean, it's definitely worth it. So, while the atmosphere is a 10 out of 10, the gameplay to go along with it drags it down significantly, as it's simply too much all at once. And lots of it is really mandatory if you want any real shot at surviving long term. But even with everything I just said being true, it still never had a fair shot because Treyarch didn't even bother to promote the fucking map. Talk about a giant mess. Then, DLC 2 comes along. Which, despite how unsuccessful Dead of the Night was, despite how unsuccessful Dead of the Night was, doesn't look like you are right about this one at all. Now, if you don't like the map, sure, that's fine, you just don't like the map. But saying that the map is a failure when the community as a whole holds it in a positive light is very disingenuous. Sure, they don't see it as, like, one of the greatest of the greats, like it's not Origins or Mob of the Dead tier, but a lot more people like it than they don't. And hell, even at launch there was a lot of people proclaiming that Dead of the Night was a good map, and some even said it was the best map in the entire game at that point. Having an opinion that goes against the popular opinion is perfectly fine. I know my opinion on Black Ops 4 is the perfect example of that. But don't try to pass it off like it's the community's opinion at large. And I'm speeding past the analysis of the Ancient Evil gameplay section because I pretty much agree with everything he says besides something about the special enemies, but at this point I'd just be beating off a dead horse. I'd say this map and 9 are the two universal favorites of this game, which is ironic given Voyage and Dead of the Night are universally hated the most. Once again, Dead of the Night is nowhere near universally hated, see my previous response. Making it an even split amongst the Chaos maps. Hell, even the Ether maps we got are like that. Blood of the Dead was a huge letdown, but Classified ended up being solid. It just goes to show how up and down this game is. There's a constant shift in momentum between all of these maps, making it really hard to assess as a whole. So far, it's gone two Chaos maps, followed by two Ether maps, followed by the final two Chaos maps. I wonder what the final two maps are going to look like. Though I'm not against how the story ultimately panned out, I certainly think the gameplay of these final two maps, DLC 3's Alpha Omega and DLC 4's Tog Der Toten, left a lot to be desired. I'm lumping these two maps together because they're actually very similar and share many of the same good, but more so bad qualities. Both maps are of course remakes, Alpha Omega being yet another Nuketown remake, which was pretty much copy and pasted from Blackout. And On the contrary, if you look into the development history of this game, Alpha Omega was made first and then ported to Blackout. This was revealed when the decompiled scripts for this game were released. Link in the description. Besides, why does it even matter? Blackout plays nothing like Zombies, and neither does multiplayer. So really, the only comparison you've got is Nuketown Zombies and Black Ops 2, and these maps couldn't be more different, besides the fact that the standard Nuketown layout is shared. But Alpha Omega is literally like eight times bigger and all that new playable space has never been played before in Zombies. Alpha Omega is also a quest-styled map, whereas Nuketown Zombies in Black Ops 2 was a simple survival map with the twist of the random perks. Now, I might not like Alpha Omega as a map, but unoriginality isn't really a problem. Hogged or Toten reimagined Call of the Dead. Side note, I love the final map being German for Day of the Dead, contrasting with the very first map, Night of the Dead. It wraps the whole thing together beautifully. The unoriginality of these maps trickle into the gameplay, as neither map seemed to be eager to innovate in any significant way, starting with most notably, the Wonder Weapons. Alpha Omega's Wonder Weapon is none other than the Ray Gun Mark II, but this time having four elemental upgrades. 
refreshing. Don't get me wrong, they're super fucking cool, but I'm not gonna let that cloud my judgment. The bottom line is, they're highly unoriginal. Because they took a pre-existing model and name, and changed literally everything else about the weapons? These do not function like any other wonder weapons we've had in the past. I guarantee you, if they had different names and models, but otherwise were exactly the same as they are now, you would not bat an eye. Which also goes for Tog's wonder weapons. Let's take a look at what they've got. The Thunder Gun, exhilarating. The Tundra Gun, why didn't they just stick with this one instead of both? And this Wonderwaf Scavenger Hybrid, whose name is so difficult to pronounce, I simply won't do it. They're not particularly bad, but not particularly great either, which makes them even harder to wrap my arms around. Not particularly good, huh? Once again, this sounds like a skill issue. I'm assuming he's not talking about the Thunder Gun when he says that they're not particularly great. Because, I mean, well, it's the Thunder Gun, do I really need to explain this? The Wonder Wolf initially seems like it isn't that powerful. The trick is you need to get headshots with it. If you hit the head, then it will chain kill a bunch of zombies, and as long as you can consistently nail those headshots, it's actually better than the DG2. As for the Tundra Gun, the trick to that is to sort of treat it like an explosive weapon. Make sure you put some distance between you and the zombies before firing. That way, you can avoid downing yourself. Keep those in mind, and Tog's wonder weapons are actually pretty effective. The boss zombies follow suit, as in both maps we get lightning hounds, which are no different than regular hounds, the most common boss zombie ever, and Nova Crawlers return, granted in slightly different form, but uninspired nonetheless. Oh, and how can I forget the electric zombies? Okay, so both maps are giant recycling bins, Weren't you bitching earlier that the Chaos maps had too many boss zombies? So when these Aether maps scale back on the amount of boss zombies and scale back their intensity, now you're complaining that there's not enough? The fuck? But what about the core mechanics? Well, Alpha Omega's power system consists of turning four gas valves that not only turn off at random throughout the game, but switch locations too, which might just be the most infuriating way to keep the map charged. Tog doesn't want to feel left out though, and decides to take the one power switch Call of the Dead had and multiply it by three. How is this an improvement? Because it allows you to turn on a couple things as you progress through the map, as opposed to turning on literally everything at once. The only other Zombies map that had multiple power switches was Blood of the Dead. So yeah, this is an innovation. Tog does have a few key differences other than its gorgeous atmosphere though that I think elevates it above Alpha Omega, and that's the Hermit, challenges, and golden pack-a-punch, which only appears in short spurts, but only requires you to throw your gun in there once for the standard 5,000 points instead of having to do it five times for the same effect on all previous maps, which is less of a benefit and more of a fix of what was a major flaw in the game to begin with. All I can say is, when you post your Cold War review, you better keep that same energy, because you sure did not in this video. Keep that same energy. I wouldn't say Victus is a benefit either. Each of these maps expand upon its predecessor with various new areas of the map and convenient means of transportation with the teleporters and zip lines respectively, which I'll give it credit for, but with everything else being unoriginal, it doesn't quite ring the same way. It's not supposed to ring the same way. Nuketown and Call of the Dead were initially simple survival maps, but with a twist that added a unique challenge. In Nuketown, that was the random perks, and on Call of the Dead, that was George. Alpha, Omega, and Togder Toten instead go for the quest-style approach to the maps, which is completely different from the maps they were based on. Once again, you're missing the point. These two maps aren't bad, but reek of mediocrity, which made the last legs of this game wobbly. Well, there you have it. The giant mess that is Black Ops 4 Zombies. It was a confusing tug of war between a largely uninteresting new chaos storyline and the classic Aether storyline limping to its grave. Though I generally had fun with this game, especially with the new Russian gauntlet modes, I'd be lying if I said this game didn't feel filler, since we really should have gotten the Great War finale back in BO3. Instead, we got this slowly animated cutscene, and though we got four original Chaos maps, the other four were all remakes, essentially checking off whatever maps hadn't yet been remastered with Zombies Chronicles. It's one thing to have one or two remakes in a game, but when half of the maps are remasters, it just goes to show how uninspired the game as a whole was. So by your logic, Black Ops 3 was uninspired, got it. 
as if they made it because they had to, not because they were super passionate about it. You don't say. You want to know why Treyarch gets up in the morning and goes to work every day? Because money, that's why. Same reason why Activision keeps churning out these COD games year after year. The development behind the scenes was shaky at best, and a lot of the resources were poured into Blackout, but it doesn't change the fact that Treyarch is a AAA studio, and they did have a good amount of time to get it all done. I think the hardest thing to accept about this game is the fact that it's actually not so bad in a vacuum, devoid of context. But unfortunately, it followed up far and away the most successful Zombies title to date, making it pale in comparison. The engine was clunky. Whoa, 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 hold the fuck up. What do you mean the engine was janky? Are you going to explain what you didn't like about the engine? Or why you think it's janky? Or why it's suddenly a massive problem in Black Ops 4 and not in any of the previous Call of Duty games, despite the fact that every single Call of Duty game prior to Modern Warfare 2019 after COD 4 literally uses the exact same fucking engine? No? Yeah, in the last video I responded to from Tim Hansen, he did the exact same shit. He just said the engine was bad, but he never explained what about it he didn't like. Except here, it's kind of worse because he doesn't even bring up the engine in this video until the fucking conclusion. Bit of advice? When you're concluding your video, you're supposed to be wrapping up all your points together. Don't introduce new stuff that you didn't talk about in the body of your video. Introduce it in the body of the video or in the video's introduction. The base mechanics were mostly downgraded, the maps weren't even in the correct order, there was a lack of true innovation. It's a prime example of the recurring theme of this game. Pointless innovation. Change for the sake of change, and not genuine improvement. Keep that same energy. And the game had an overall identity crisis that not even BO2 could hope to match. This game was the breaking point for so many long-term fans of the mode, as the gameplay was subpar and the story got way too confusing for any casual to follow. The story got too confusing for casuals to follow back in Black Ops 2, and this also rang true for Black Ops 3. It's not a new problem in Black Ops 4. Which wouldn't have been such an issue if the game hadn't prioritized it so much. My friends and I created some fond memories with this game, and I always appreciated custom mutations allowing me to manipulate it to my liking, which I did for this video if you somehow didn't notice. But I've got to say this game was a complete and utter mess, and it was an underwhelming way to wrap up the past decade of what was an otherwise spectacular mode. And just like that, the video's over. Honestly, that was a whole lot worse than I initially thought it was when I watched it for the first time. I honestly think it's worse than his last video that he did on Black Ops 4, the other one I responded to, because at least there he admits it was a rant, so at least I'm not supposed to expect any critical thinking, but this one was scripted and planned out, and it was somehow worse in quality. He contradicted himself so many times. But anyways, that's going to be about it for this video. If you enjoyed, make sure you hit that like button and subscribe for more, and tell me what you think of this video. Anyways, that's about it. Peace! The poison one comes in your ass.